that there are 411 people who have registered to participate in this webinar, which is absolutely wonderful news for us at Appman. It, uh, it's very close to our previous record. And it's just great to see this level of enthusiasm and participation. Thank you for that. So this is the next in our, uh, it's from 60 countries, by the way, 411 people from uh, 60 countries, great stuff. This is the next in our Appman Tech Talk webinars on uh, vector control. And this webinar will focus on the important topic of uh, vector surveillance, why it matters and the status and capacity of national malaria control programs to conduct such surveillance. So I need to introduce myself, uh, I'm told. Uh, my name is Leo, Leo Brock, Technical Lead for the App and Vector Control Working Group. And I have the pleasure of working with a great team, including uh, Dr. Tin Cho Thu, also Dr. Ponsi Hain, and of course our Appman Senior Director, Amita Chebi. Appman, uh, as you may or may not know, stands for the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network, and it works very closely with APALMA, which is the Asia Pacific Malaria Leaders Alliance. So APALMA and APMAN undertake initiatives in support of malaria elimination in the 22 member states that they represent in Asia Pacific. So from APALMA and APMAN, uh, we're very grateful for all of you for finding time to participate in these webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, I need to say a little bit of uh, background to this uh, particular webinar, give some context. Vector control is a core strategy for malaria control uh, and elimination. And in fact, it has been the single most important tool to combat malaria ever since humankind discovered in the late 1800s what malaria is and how it is transmitted. So any shortfalls in our ability to implement vector control therefore impacts on our ability to rid our planet of malaria. And this webinar will look at the findings of surveys to assess the status of vector surveillance. And vector surveillance is the foundation of control interventions in national malaria control programs across the world. Findings that were published in recent months in international journals, specifically a malaria journal. And we'll also look at ways in which some of the identified shortfalls uh, might be addressed. So uh, allow me a, a, uh, to spend a few seconds on how this webinar is going to unfold. And I'll try and be brief. I talk too much, I know. We'll have three PowerPoint presentations back to back, each about 10 minutes in length. This will be followed by a question and answer session where we will have an additional expert pan panel member to assist in commenting on presentations and addressing questions. Everyone uh, in the audience and indeed the panel as well will be muted and video off uh, until eventually our panelists are also put on, but the, the audience is muted and, and video off unfortunately uh, for web reasons. Uh, but our audience members can submit written questions during the presentations. If you want to uh, put a question please precede your question with the name of the panel member you would like to respond to your question. For example, uh, Prof Tom, please tell me how I can get rid of malaria. Just put a name in front of it so that it prompts that person to respond. I ask members of the audience to please look at those questions periodically. And if there are questions you like or you want to support, then you can upvote that question. You just click on the thumbs up icon uh, below the question, and, and depending how many people do that, the question moves up the list, and it makes it more likely that that question will be dealt with and responded to. Now, uh, very importantly, please, I want to ask your help here. We need your help to, to take this issue of vector surveillance capacity shortfalls forward. In the next day or so, I'm going to send to all members of the audience an email to ask if you could let us know the top three most important vector surveillance capacity shortfalls that you have, that you would like to We would genuinely appreciate it. It helps us understand what capacity building courses we should be preparing and presenting. 
at, there'll be another short poll, very short, uh, at the end of the Q&A session, the end of this webinar. And, and I'm asking you, please uh, have a little bit of patience. Uh, just wait until the end of question uh, Q&A session and uh, just fill in that short poll. Again, it helps us to identify what subjects, what topics would you like to see as webinar in, in, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be made available on the Appen website in a few days time. All right, let's get to the presentations. Uh, Dr. Pohn, uh, maybe you can get our speakers on uh, the screen, please. So we have with us today three top rate uh, people to talk to us on vector surveillance. First up is uh, Prof. Uh, Tom Burkott, followed by Dr. Tanya Russell, and finally, uh, Dr. Robert Farlow. To these speakers and uh, also our respected Q&A panelists, Dr. Pradeep Srivastava, please accept the gratitude from all of us. We appreciate your time. So uh, to introduce you to our first speaker, Professor Tom Burkott is a professor at the Australian Institute for Tropical uh, Health and Medicine, James Cook University, Cairns in Australia. And I should mention that Prof Burkott is also a member of the Global Malaria Programs Malaria Elimination Oversight Committee and a, and a member of the Malaria Policy Advisory Group. So Tom, I'd like to hand over to you uh, to share some of uh, your findings with us, please. Thanks, Leo. Uh, could you, could someone else drive my slides, please? Uh, sure. Uh, Dr. Tin, would you mind pulling up that presentation of uh, Tom? Not the only one with technical difficulties. No? Okay, that's... Yeah, let's give it a few seconds. It seems okay. there are a couple of glitches. No worries, we'll get it sorted out. Tim's, Tim's pretty good at this. Okay, there we great. go. Thank you. All right. Now, I've been, I'm going to talk a little bit about the present status of vector surveillance, and I'm going to talk about some of the indicators that are being monitored by national programs and how they're being used in decision making. But I want to start out by talking a little bit about why vector surveillance matters. Could I have the next slide, please? And and I think every talk on malaria and every talk on the vectors of malaria should really start out with a slide like this, which makes the point that malaria vector co control, as Leo pointed out, is responsible for most of the reduction in malaria cases, in, uh, it, particularly in, from this study in Sub-Saharan Africa on falciparum, in which 80% of the reduction in malaria cases is believed to have been averted from uh, two interventions, insecticide treated nets, which were responsible for 69% of the reduction in indoor residual spraying, which was responsible for 11% of the reduction. Okay, next slide. Now, these gains are really quite fragile because we only have two interventions which are recommended for use, universal implementation. Again, these is IRS and ITNs. Next slide. And also in limited number of scenarios, larval source management is, is encouraged. Now, again, so we only have a handful of tools at our disposal right now that is in the process of changing, but uh, these gains could rapidly be lost. Now, vector surveillance matters, next slide, because we need to preserve the effectiveness of the few tools that we do have to uh, of malaria vector control or physiological resistance to insecticides and behavioral resistance to insecticides. Now on this map from the uh, WHO's malaria threats map, we see in the red um, dots signifying where there's confirmed resistance to insecticides that have been found. And this just highlights a growing threat of physiological resistance to insecticides. But here in the Asia Pacific region, we can see a lot of the green dots, which represent areas where 
there is no physiological resistance to insecticides that were recorded, so the mosquitoes were susceptible to the insecticide. But in many cases, these mosquitoes are avoiding contact with the insecticides by changing their behavior. So what we call behavioral resistance. So mosquitoes are biting either more outdoors or early in the evening before people go inside their houses or sleep underneath their bed nets. Next slide, please. Now, the importance of vector surveillance has been recognized in the global technical strategy for malaria is, in fact, that's been elevated and, and is being treated as a core intervention in the global technical strategy. Next slide, please. Now, the World Health Organization has identified five of these are highlighted in the Malaria Surveillance Monitoring and Evaluation Reference Manual. These are, first of all, to characterize the receptivity for uh, uh, malaria by, in order to allow intervention uh, stratification to take place. So, and where you put your interventions to um, maintain transmission. The second uh, objective is to track vector density so that we know transmission seasonality. And this really applies to timing of when we put in interventions, particularly indoor residual spraying. The third objective is to track insecticide resistance so we can decide which insecticides should be purchased. So we're trying to choose insecticides that the uh, will be effective against the, our local mosquitoes. The fourth objective is to identify other threats to the effectiveness of vector control. So this refers really to behavioral resistance and uh, where, monitoring when mosquitoes are taking blood meals and where they're taking blood meals, whether they're entering houses or feeding outdoors. And the fifth objective is to monitor intervention coverage and the quality to identify gaps in our intervention coverage. Uh, I also want to point out that the emphasis on stratifying control using, using local data is a key part of the high burden for high impact strategy of the World Health Organization, which is really stressing using local data to customize our mix of interventions by the vulnerability of the vectors and epidemiology of malaria. Now to undertake these objectives requires tracking specific vector indicators, and I'll go into those in a little bit. Next slide, please. Now I wanna present the results of a survey that we did uh, in a special hand, uh, hats off to Tanya Russell, who really did the heavy lifting on putting this survey together. On the top of the slide, you can see the link to the, the, the survey. So if you're interested in the specific questions that we ask, you can, all, you can go there. The survey is available in English, French, and Spanish. And we ask questions on five major categories, and we won't have time to go into very a few of these things. So, but just to let you know that in the survey, we asked about what interventions countries are using to control malaria, how they're monitoring intervention access and use. I'm going to talk, restrict my few comments, my few minutes to talking about the vector indicators that were measured and how they were measured and also about how this data is being used in decision-making. And then Tanya Russell will follow up my talk by talking a little bit about national malaria control programs, capacity and strategic plans, and a bit about the techniques uh, that countries are using. Next slide, please. Now, 35 countries participate in the survey and they're shown in different colors on the map. And in the following slides, I'm gonna be, oh, no, no, not yet. In the, in the slides that will follow, the, the data that's in red will refer to the responses from the countries in the Asia Pacific. And we're gonna be comparing those to responses in the countries in Africa who participated, which will be shown in blue. And I'd like to really thank the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network for their support for this survey and which allowed us to get responses from 14 of the Atman countries. So a special thanks off to uh, uh, Leo and his crew there. Next slide, please. Now, I wanna start out by pointing out the in the boxes on the left-hand side that are shaded in the light yellow, those are the indicators that the World Health Organization recommends that countries monitor. These are the vector surveillance indicators that are recommended by the World Health Organization. Again, the red 
The red bars indicate the percent of countries in Asia Pacific that indicated that they were measuring these indicators and the blue bars indicates the percent of countries in Africa that were uh, measuring these indicators. Next slide. Now, I want to point out a couple, highlight a couple of points about the data on this slide. We won't be able to go into everything. First of all, only 58% of the countries were measuring adult density. I think it's really a key parameter. To, and it's not just about measuring receptivity, and, but it's really a key parameter because, next slide, a lot of the other indicators that are recommended to be measured really depend on just monitoring adult mosquito densities. So things like measuring the peak biting time, uh, indoor outdoor biting, measuring insecticide resistance mechanism, measuring infection rates in the mosquitoes, being able to identify the mosquitoes, looking at a proportion of feeds on humans really depend on monitoring adult densities. Next slide. Oh, yeah, another really critical parameter that the, that most countries are doing really quite well is measuring the phenotypic resistance to insecticides by either the WHO tube tests or the CDC bottle bioassay. And so about 78%, so four out of five of the countries that participated in the survey uh, indicated that they were measuring insecticide resistance or insecticide susceptibility. So that's a really key thing, because again, both of the, the primary interventions that we're using are insecticide dependent. So this is really key, a key indicator to be measured. Next slide. Another indicator in which we're not doing nearly as well has to do with being able to identify the vector species in our areas. Now, I think as many of the people listening in know that in order to identify mosquitoes, First of all, you have to measure the, the you, have, you have to make an identification based on morphological criteria to the species complex, and you have to then follow that up with a uh, genetic confirmation of the species identification because of the isomorphic species in the complex that we have. Africa was doing better than the Asian Pacific region with 67% of their countries indicating that they were using DNA based, based techniques to identify vector species, but in the Countries that responded from the Asia Pacific region, only 8% of the countries indicated that they were using DNA based techniques to identify their vector species. So, this is something that is really going to be critical going forward that we increase our capacity to undertake species identifications. Next slide. Now, I want to shift a little bit and talk about vector control strategies being used by national malaria control programs. Uh, now, overall, among the 35 countries, about half of the countries said that they had an insecticide resistance management strategy. By the way, the colors, I should have started out by saying something about the color. The darker the green color indicates a higher percentage of countries that are actually undertaking that or saying that they use that strategy. About two thirds of the countries indicated that they're using insect uh, integrated vector management. And about 64% of the, the uh, respondents said that they were using data to make decisions. So then the next question really comes up with what sort of uh, decisions are being made with vector data? So can we have the next slide, please? Now, next slide. There were seven different types of decisions that were being made with vector data. Uh, these were uh, using data to decide which insecticide to purchase, deciding on locations for where to spray IRS, uh, information on net durability to determine which nets to buy, uh, where, what sort of larval uh, control measures to use, uh, what sort of adult control strategies to use. There were countries indicated they were using uh, data on vectors to define the receptivity for transmission and for identifying sites for focal sites. Now, I want to point out, go into a little bit of detail in a couple of these. Next slide. The first is that overall, only one out of five countries was actually using data on insecticide susceptibility to decide which insecticides to purchase. So remember, 80% uh, of the countries were measuring insecticide susceptibility by measuring the phenotypes. About half the countries had an insecticide resistance management strategy, but only 
18% of the countries are actually using this data to decide which insecticides to purchase. The next slide. Now, we had seven countries in the elimination phase of malaria, which were participating in, in this survey. And all seven of these countries use IRS as part of their, their national strategy, but none of them were actually using any data on uh, identifying where mosquitoes are resting on the walls of houses to decide where to apply insecticides. Next slide. Among the 26 countries who answered this, uh, participated in this survey that were in the control phase, uh, all of these countries use long lasting insecticide treated nets, but only one country indicated that they were using data on net durability to decide which nets to purchase. So these are areas in which I think there's, there's scope for improvement. Next slide, please. Now, okay, so we just touched a little bit on some of the data and most of the details of this data can be found in this uh, in the PDF that's shown up on the with the QR code here. So if you want to get more information on uh, what's happening, what's the present status, at least the status in 2018 of national malaria control programs on vector surveillance, you can find a lot more detail here. And I just want to close with three key points to make it. First of all, there is going, the need for vector data is going to increase as, as we get close, as countries get closer to elimination and as more choices on what sort of vector control strategies become available. The second point to make is that there's a need to increase the numbers of indicators that are being monitored by national area control programs. There's only a mean of about uh, three and a half uh, indicators, vector surveillance indicators being measured by national malaria control programs at the present time. And finally, really what we really need to do immediately is to increase the use of the data that we do collect to make vector control decisions. And then finally, the last slide. Next slide. I just want, again, I want to thank our funders, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation for their support for this project. And I want to thank all the national malaria control programs and the U.S. President's Malaria Initiative for their cooperation, along with the African Leaders Malaria Alliance, and particularly the Asian Pacific Malaria and Elimination uh, Network, without whose help this uh, survey would be far less effective. Thank you. Uh, Tim, are you going to, there we go. Um, so uh, Tom, a great thank you for that wonderful overview um, and uh, some of the insights you shared, the uh, fascinating uh, insights. So. I just want to recommend to our audience members that each of the three presentations are based on particular publications that were in Mal Malaria Journal, if I remember correctly, around about August, September, somewhere around there last year. Uh, and I can absolutely fully recommend those three. Each of those three publications are really worth reading. So. Uh, if you find any of this interesting, what you're listening to, uh, I would really recommend you go back to Malaria Journal, look it up uh, and uh, read these three presentations. Really, really wonderful insights and understanding uh, what is happening within our national malaria control programs and the efforts they are making and where there are shortfalls uh, and what the needs are and so on. At least at the time of the surveys, three or four years ago. It took some time for the analyses and the write-ups and publication eventually. Uh, so I'm going to move on now. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, Jenyan, thank you for that. Dr. Tanya Russell uh, is going to talk to us uh, on National Area Control Program capacity strengths and limitations for uh, vector surveillance. Uh, Tanya is a senior research fellow at the uh, James Cook University uh, in Australia. Please, Tanya. Hi, did my screen come up? Uh, yes, it does. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. So today I'll be continuing with the presentations to focus on the strengths and the limitations of the capacity of the National Malaria Programs to conduct vector surveillance. 
So the data that I will present was collected during the same needs assessment surveys that Tom just spoke about. And as a quick reminder, the survey was completed by 35 countries. For this part of the analysis, the objective was to define the level of capacity that existed within the NMCPs to implement core vector surveillance and control activities. The data was assessed against a standardized framework, and that's on the slide here. So this framework really delineated the key elements of a program. And using this framework, we were able to identify bottlenecks for vector surveillance activities, assess the quality of vector surveillance programs, and also to prioritize bottlenecks to be addressed. So first I present the proportion of countries deploying each intervention by control status on the left and region on the right. So first I'd like to highlight that 100% of the eliminating countries deployed IRS, which is the reverse of what was recorded for bed nets, where 100% of the controlling countries deployed ITNs. Eliminating countries also had a tendency to deploy larval source management and other interventions. Other interventions were outdoor space spraying, topical repellents, hammock nets, coils and mosquito proof housing. And they were also used more frequently in the Asia Pacific, but otherwise the tools were deployed fairly similarly across the regions. So across nearly every country surveyed, the vector surveillance programs were hampered by a lack of capacity and capability. So overall, only 8% of national malaria control programs reported having sufficient capacity to implement vector surveillance. In contrast, just over half of the countries had capacity to implement LLINs or IRS. So this graph compares the relative bottlenecks to implementing vector surveillance and control activities. So if there is a big bar that indicates that more countries had limited capacity for that particular input. So vector surveillance was most heavily limited by strategic planning being a form of governance. And many countries just reported that vector surveillance wasn't seen as a priority. In contrast, LLINs and IRS control activities were generally very well integrated into the malaria strategic plans and the limitations were mostly in human resources, logistics and infrastructure. Specifically, that is the budget, training, equipment and supplies, transport and operational staff. So in terms of staff, Elimination programs do require much higher numbers of operational field staff. This was reflected in the overall number of staff that were um, in elimination programs relative to control programs. Yet what was really interesting was that control programs were less likely to actually say that their programs were understaffed. And this really reflects a difference in mentality where control programs are focused on implementing vector control compared with implementing a responsive evidence-based program that includes entomological surveillance. As countries move towards the government, train more operational staff to support the intensified activities, including vector surveillance. The respondents overwhelmingly identified that the greatest need for staffing and training was at the subnational and national, uh, subnational and field, the red and green colours. These were where the most, um, the greatest need was. The greatest need for management staff was to support vector surveillance as opposed to vector control. Vector, for vector control, activities were most often hindered by operational staff. And this is an important delineation that I want to talk about because implementing vector surveillance hinges on having higher degree staff to plan and implement and interpret the data for vector control decisions. 
Rolling out vector control requires a large team of operational and field staff. It is also noted that eliminating countries were more likely to have an established system for staff training and capacity building. And it was really highlighted that there was a big need for a training at the sub-national and field positions. It became very evident during the analyses from across all of the countries that to move forwards towards elimination, significant progress will not be made without huge investments into the numbers and capacity of programmatic staff. So um, coming back, I just wanted to really highlight those key limitations for vector surveillance. And vector surveillance, as a reminder, is really important because it enables us to understand the baseline drivers of transmission to evaluate the potential and efficacy of interventions, to understand the gaps in protection, and also to optimize the present strategies and set realistic expectations of impact. What became very clear through the analysis was that the inputs of a program did not act independently and that successful, a successful program needs capacity across all of the inputs. Thus, the limitation seen in one input can interact with others. And with that, using vector surveillance as an, as an example, operations were most heavily limited by strategic planning. And therefore, and, and that's here under governance. And without a costed plan, there were flow on impacts to, to the available budget, human resource infrastructure and the IT support as well. So um, as, as we noted, there's, um, this is based on a secondary publication, which is available here for further follow-up. And really the big conclusions are that um, moving forward, the capacity and efficiency of vector surveillance programs is, is really supported by strong governance and well-trained staff that will facilitate a drive towards elimination. And it's really important to advocate to into, for strong vector surveillance to be integrated into programs at a strategic level. Without this high level advocacy, um, vector surveillance falls to the side. I think we need to start talking about as a community. Um, and I won't repeat all of the thank yous, but, but put them up there to, again to remind everyone that there was a huge amount of people involved in this way. Thank you. So uh, Tanya, sincere thank you for that. Um, wonderful insights and again you know what Tanya uh, presented there is the tip of the iceberg of what is available in the publication that she pointed out at the end so I can but reiterate that uh, it's it's genuinely worthwhile going to look at the three publications on which this webinar is based uh, the publications in themselves are also but uh, a peek through the window of the data that was generated during the survey. Uh, but, you know, at least, you know, by reading those publications, it's, it's amazing what insight one gets. Um, so I think Tom and Tanya will support what I say here that I, I take my hat off to the National Malaria Control Programs who responded with honesty about the shortfalls and the realities they are confronted with, uh, because it's only by receiving honest opinions and understanding of what national area control programs are faced with in, uh, at all sorts of uh, levels and, and ways that one can try and find ways to support and strengthen and build up uh, our capacity, our collective capacity to deal with uh, malaria uh, and reach that slippery goal of elimination and eradication. So for those NMCP members that are present, 
Uh, Jenyan, thank you for if you contributed to that survey. Uh, Absolutely, it, it, and, and um, every every response has every um, country had different things. But reading through it, and I think what I really wanted to pull out here was that there was there were a lot of common themes. It was that where I really tried to highlight, and these were the big common themes that there was. You read over and over and over. Vector surveillance isn't a priority. It's not yeah. in the strategic plan. And these were just so so repetitive across all the programs. And I think that's one of what I really want to highlight is that that I've statistically put this together into little graphs. But but these these come from different countries, and the stories were these common themes that we see, and and it helps to build a community so that we can work together. Absolutely. Yeah, no, very valuable insights that you're sharing with us. Thank you for that, uh, Tanya. So we come to our third presentation, which is uh, Dr. Robert Farlow. Uh, and he, uh, Bob is going to give us some insights on next generation tools to improve National Malaria Control Program vector surveillance. Uh, Bob is the Chief Executive Officer of R. Farlow Consulting, LLC. Uh, I'm not sure what LLC stands for, it's some legal term, Texas, USA. But uh, just for the audience, uh, Robert is from Texas. It's now past midnight, uh, typically Texan. Uh, Robert is showing resilience and commitment and he's uh, stayed up until past midnight to share this presentation with us. And for that, we're very grateful, Robert. We uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. If some can, someone can pull up the slides for me, please. Uh, Ten, I'm assuming you're going to do that. One of the, just to give you an idea, we started for, with the surveys, we, with the pro pro programs, we ask a lot of questions about the programs and, and the strengths and weaknesses. The one thing we did not really get good feedback on was actual uh, discussions and feedback on the techniques and tools that were the um, programs were using for vector su surveillance. Next slide, please. So as we took an additional step where we interviewed 40 vector control experts from National Malaria Control Programs, uh, Ministry of Health, IVCC, universities, CDC, et cetera. And what we talked to the people about uh, was their personal experiences with the techniques that they were using to monitor and uh, the program, the mosquitoes, the efficacy, et, et cetera, of the entire program. So what we overall, the basic um, result was the road ahead is prioritizing for new techniques. Looking at the techniques we have today, the malaria research and control community identified the need for replacing the human landing catch with to determine biting rates, a new technique for age grading mosquitoes, a new technique for evaluating the active ingredient on the surface, whether that's wall or bed nets. It said real uh, restraints and amount of effort it takes to rear the mosquitoes and do all the testing with bioassays. The fourth general area was field applicable rapid assays to identify species, insecticide resistance and resistance mechanisms, and sporozoite infections. And third, with the ultimate would be designing and developing automated multiple parameter analysis for uh, species identity. So an automated system to characterize larval habitats. So based on that, next slide, please. To give an example, when we started looking at the techniques for monitoring adult mosquitoes, next slide. Okay. 
we started looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each. And this is based on the, again, uh, back up a slide, please. We started looking at the strengths and weaknesses for assessing adult mosquitoes. Could you back up one there? Uh, back up one slide, please. Two slides. Yeah, so we started asking the people specifics about their experiences as far as the benefits and weaknesses and what the real um, handicaps were on the various techniques. The human landing catch was felt to be the most effective and gave, gave the best range of indicators as far as entomological outputs. However, as you can see that all the techniques had limitations in regard to labor, cost, ease of use and getting supplies to remote areas. This is just a snapshot just for the adult mosquitoes. We did the same analysis for the other ones you can read further in the paper. Based on this, then we start looking forward. What do we need to do to address these limitations? Next slide, please. So what we did was we took the expert advice and developed draft TPPs, ours are target product profiles, which basically describe criteria for new surveillance techniques. And these were grouped in three categories. Surveillance, again, coming up with a, an alternative to human landing technique uh, for adult sampling trying to come up with automated traps, which would one, identify species, identify density, and able to collect uh, very rapidly a number of um, adults for further analysis. And then the, one other thing is quantitative larval sampling. With dip sam uh, dipping, you, it's hard to estimate what quantitatively is a large larval population in a general area. But as far as analytical techniques, age grading of adult mosquito specimens, we need new surveillance tools there. RDTs to identify plasmodiums in Anopheles species, and also analytical test techniques to test for insecticide resistance in adult populations. And one other thing we talked about bioassays, uh, we need a good quality assurance mechanism for testing on a wide variety, insecticide active ingredients on a wide variety of surfaces. This might be blankets, bed nets, walls, uh, et cetera, as we move forward with new techniques that might be developed uh, in the near future. Next slide, please. And it's not just about techniques. And a lot of the discussions with the experts they identified a number of biological knowledge gaps which are needed as we move forward, particularly in elimination. We do a good job of saying, okay, we can collect adults and uh, mosquito adults in a, a structure. We can find larvae in uh, aquatic habitat. But one of the key pieces that we don't know much about is where, the, what is the vector in doing between blood feeding and overposition site. How do you characterize a resting site outdoors, which might be a new a weak link to attack the mosquito population with a new tool? And also with larval habitat characterization, what are the characteristics of that aquatic habitat that is drawing in certain species and which is uh, also addressing more prolific production in a, in a habitat than another one. And that could also lead to more targeted intervention optimization. As far as optimizing new surveillance tools, we do a lot of trapping, but we need a carbon dioxide replacement to get around uh, that limitation of getting it in the field. Human odors and other blood seeking lures would be ideal for use in traps in the future and also overposition attractants for the Anopheles, which we really don't have today. 
One other key thing that was identified was we need a genomic sequence for all major species in all regions. Next slide, please. As far as data collection and interpretation of that data, that's one of the issues that we really need to improvements on as well. We need algorithms to basically figure out what is representative sampling. We tend to represent to sample in certain areas that we have historically sampled, either water or round structures. But what is really representative sampling to get a real feel of what the population is over a geographic area? And as Tom pointed out, we need that to also define and stratifying receptivity. And also how do we correlate resist insecticide resistance data to impact on the interventions, whether that's bioassay data or genetics data. And also, and we've heard this for years, is how do we interpret experimental HUT data and apply that to scale and predict, it, predict that very well in the future. And then translation of surveillance data, how do we take trap data, biting rates, and put that into population estimates on a geographic scale? And as I touched on earlier, larval habitat productivity and receptivity, how do we define that? How do we, how do we really characterize those larval habitats to better understand what, in, what do we need to do as far as interventions? What do we need to do to modify those habitats to reduce that productivity? Next slide, please. We talked about the 40 uh, people that were gracious enough to give us their expert invite uh, advice and uh, input. This is listed here. We want to acknowledge those. Next slide, please. And as Tom and Tanya talked about, this is a, uh, the uh, Malaria Journal reference that you can follow up on. Next slide, please. To wrap things up, these are the key points from the three presentations that we've just completed. Vector surveillance is needed to preserve the effectiveness of present control strategies and also to stratify intervention deployment uh, at the local level uh, and in the future. Vector, as far as vector surveillance, the quick win is use the data being collected and use the local data to guide control um, options at the local level. Improved vector surveillance needs are increasing the capacity and efficacy efficiency of the entomological staff. We need high level advocacy, advocacy for vector surveillance. We need to expand the number of surveillance indicators being measured. As far as next gen surveillance methods, we need those to have the potential to overcome capacity and efficiency limitations. And when vector data in the future really needs to be based on epidemiologically relevant data. Next slide, please. basically just acknowledging Gates Foundation funding for this project. Uh, so <clears throat> Robert, uh, wonderful overview there of uh, uh, surveillance techniques and the shortfalls, very penetrating questions you asked along the way uh and some uh, profound needs uh, uh as a person who's like you probably spent multiple thousands of nights applying or sitting out at night collecting mosquitoes uh, very acutely aware of the shortfalls and the needs for improved techniques uh, they are not easy to answer uh, so uh, that'll be one of the questions we ask during uh, question an answer session, but for 
uh, getting starting us thinking about these issues, Robert. Uh, thank you for raising, uh, giving us that wonderful perspective. And again, for the benefit of the audience, it's the tip of the iceberg that Robert uh, presented us with there. Uh, much deeper insight and understanding is available by going to the paper, uh, which was published uh, later, late last year, and reading about uh, about these issues. So, uh, to all three, thank you. We now move on to questions and answers. We have the privilege to have with us today an eminent member of the vector control community in Asia Pacific. And I'd like to welcome and thank Dr. Pradeep uh, Srivastava to our expert panel to help uh, during the Q&A session. Dr. Pradeep is the previous joint director of the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Division of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India. He's also uh, deputy chair of the Appman Vector Control Working Group a man with a great depth of experience and insight of things, uh, vector control, vector surveillance. So I'm going to direct my first question at you, uh, Dr. Pradeep. We're going to get to the questions from the audience in a minute. Uh, sorry, just by the way, one of the audience members asked uh, to please list the presentations. I can assure our audience members the entire webinar is being recorded and it will be placed on websites that will be shown on screen towards the end uh, of the Q&A session. So keep your eye on the screen, have a piece of paper and a pencil available so you can write down those sites where the uh, webinar will be uh, uploaded. And the individual presentations will also be uploaded uh, in PDO format for audience members to refer back to and uh, go through at their own time and pace. Dr. Pradeep, it has been three or four years since these surveys were done on which the presentations are based. Uh, three years or four years is a long time in one sense, but it's also a very a short time in terms of institutional government agencies to shift direction. Since those surveys were done three, four years ago. Do you think much has changed in your perspective, in your experience within NMCPs in terms of their capacity and implementation of vector surveillance? Uh, and if there's still pretty much the same situation prevailing, what in your opinion are the most glaring areas or issues where capacity strengthening needs to take place? Uh, please, Dr. Pradeep, your, your comments. Thank you, Leo, for giving me this opportunity. And this is a very, very uh, difficult question uh, to answer in one sentence. The reason is that the issues are so much complicated and uh, intermingled within each other that, you know, that there is a lot of changes which has happened in last uh, four or five years or 10 years, you can say. If we take the example of uh, India specifically, because uh, I mean, that will represent a major chunk of uh, Asian subcontinent. Now, where are the vector control experts? Where are the entomologists? So this is the major change. And then the complication starts that where is the priority? We all are talking and we have been talking since decades that uh, there should be entomologists. Look from top at the global institutions also, where are the entomologists and how many entomologists in WHO, how many entomologists in national malaria control programs, how many entomologists or vector control specialists. There is, a, there is an ad hoc arrangement for engaging, hiring the people and start giving the work. So that complicates their capacity. Now, once the infrastructure, which is not capable, we are not focusing on the capacity. And once we are focusing to some extent to build their capacity by the time, because they are on ad hoc arrangements, if they get better opportunity, so the attrition rate becomes very high. So they don't, I mean, the system is not able to sustain 
the specialists or the people who have been trained to do that job so these are the changes which has happened and which has affected lot of vector control because all the three presentations they have focused that vector control has to be sustained the last slide where there was a win situation the win win situation will come only when the trained people are retained and then the infrastructure is strengthened by way of having adequate human resources tanya's one slide was very very important and it has given indication to the whole complication that see the graph at zero mm -hmm. level or 1% or 2% only people are having the 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 vector control specialist or the entomologist now coming to the answer to your question you know there are two different dimensions first thing is that vector control specialist and entomologist or the vector surveillance people has to be treated in a different manner their capacity has to be developed in a different manner the same person cannot be to some extent they can be but not wholly because when we discuss about the entomological parameters vector surveillance parameter this is very very important that only experts they can go and do that there are certain issues which vector control experts can implement in the field which an entomologist or vector control surveillance tools experts they will not be able to do because otherwise there will be diversion of the focus the second important point in the vector surveillance which is the main focus for today's webinar you know there is lot of changes in old parameters so now there is a need of paradigm shift now which paradigm shift what are the parameters which were designed for malaria some of them they have been taken for other vector borne diseases but if we are talking for malaria elimination now for density now density is the most common and which is the easiest way to do by most of the entomologists or vector control experts many of the people they are not doing the the biting or landing collection human landing collection hlc which was about talking and there was one one question also what are the parameters which can be digitalized which can be just surveyed using digital platforms that needs to be done there is major issue with insecticide resistance monitoring which is the most complicated for taking a decision which many of the countries they are not using because resistance data was to be clubbed with the epidemiological information because everybody says that even if it is resistance found in who susceptibility ticket it shows some impact so to that some impact and that is why this 5x and 10x uh, the bottle essay has come into picture that how to take a decision now if you want to change the decision within the synthetic pyrethroid group how are you going to take a decision that oh look here you are not going to take delta methin or you are going to take alpha or you are doing you cannot go on changing from organochlorine to organophosphate and to synthetic and then to carbamates this is complicated issue now the last point which i just want to address that in case of insecticide resistance the the surveillance expert vector surveillance experts they need to be guided especially on those mosquitoes where the density is very high i'll give you one example of minimus in in northeastern region of uh, india if the number is very very less say for example it is very difficult to find more than 10 or 15 how are you going to put the test are you going to put the test with low number with the insecticide then the protocol has to be changed from who these are very very typical issue which we have been discussing on our decision making authorities and then other things are as usual the priority is not there human resource is not there and this is not an a, a easy capsule to to twist and give it provide to all the national malaria control program as on date i will just tell three points very very important points that vector center surveillance and vector control experts they need to be prioritized and capacity building separately has to be done area for the vector surveillance has to be decided so that it becomes true representative you cannot have one sentinel sites for three districts or four districts and some some jurisdiction has to be set up which is actually not in global guideline we have to do the brainstorming for that and then the inputs data and output data for the entomological surveillance has to be monitored so that their outcome is reviewed 
before it is taken for implementation in the control programs or elimination programs i feel i feel i have tried to answer leo for your your question uh dr pradeep i i get a shiver running down my spine i mean you put your finger exactly on uh, what i think many vector uh uh, practice, vector control practitioners in in uh, in Asia Pacific and globally share as concerns this whole issue of the global decline and need for medical entomologists, and it just keeps getting uh, worse and worse, and one doesn't see answers on the horizon for dealing with that. So uh, thank you for a whole range of uh, issues that you raised. They're all very, very uh, important and relevant. Uh, it, re it reflects your great understanding of uh, surveillance and control program issues, challenges, needs. Uh, so Dr. Pradeep, uh, thank you for that overview, wonderful really great to have heard those words mm -hmm. thank you for that at least part of those issues you raised will be covered in this next question that i'd like to pose to professor burkott uh tom i'd like to ask some people are of the opinion uh that conducting short courses to strengthen uh, the technical capacity is not addressing the deeper fundamental issues and that more incisive changes need to happen. It includes things like making entomology a more attractive career choice uh, by creating better incentives, career paths, etc. There's also the issue, as uh, Dr. Pradeep also uh, mentioned, uh, of ensuring that entomologists are included at the management table, that their voice is heard during the planning and program management decision-making process. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on, on these issues? Anything you'd like to share with us? Sure, this is a, this is a, um, an issue that I usually have a discussion with Mike McDonald over a beer or two, but uh, now we have a, a bigger forum here to bring it up. I, I've, it, it, it's, I've always liked to joke that the, the demand for vector expertise is growing, the supply of the vector biologists is shrinking, and the value of the entomologist has relatively remained unchanged and at a low level. Uh, I mean, one could argue, is this really true or is it just a perception? I think the data would support the view that the numbers of uh, vector biologists are, are very limited, and, and I think the anecdotal evidence supports this view as well. I mean, how did we get into this situation? I think if you look back at it, I think a lot, part of it is, it, this is a problem of our own making. I don't think we've been very good at communicating. We haven't been very vocal in, in promoting the importance of, of vector surveillance and control. Uh, and and I, I think we need to change it and be better at, at communicating to our, 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 um, our audience out there. And part of this is, is that we really need to change the culture of the vector control, vector-borne disease community. If we, if we want to sit at the decision-making table, and I've heard a lot of uh, programmatic officers say, you know, we're treated as technicians, we don't get a choice in, in, in making the decisions. And I, and I think we have to start, part of the part, way of changing this, this culture, I think we need to correct the misunderstanding, I think that many have, who assume that mosquito control is simple and when in reality, it's incredibly complex. I mean, we've got 41 dominant vector species who are constantly being changing their behavior and changing their, their resistance profiles and response to the things that we're doing to them. And, and part of this is a reflection of the efficacy of the interventions that we're doing because, you know, if we're not hurting the mosquito uh, populations, they don't need to develop resistance. They don't need to change their behavior. So what we're doing is effective. And, but it means we also have to uh, uh, communicate that we are effective at what we're doing. We're making a major impact on, on the effectiveness of malaria control uh, programs and that uh, the situation is complex and we have to stay on top of it. So, okay, so how do we, how do we change this uh, 
this culture. And I think there, there's a couple of things. There's a real, we, as pointed out, there is a real problem that we don't have a good career structure in place right now. In many countries, there's not many vector control officers out there. And I think we need to uh, create a better career structure for that. And I think we need to provide the training that, that's required to have uh, quality, quality officers in place. Uh, that's one approach, in, in long, in, and that's more of a long-term approach when we talk about changing culture. I think in the short term, probably what we need to do is we need to better educate the individuals who are sitting at the management, at the decision-making table right now. If, if people go to just get a, a degree in an MPH in, in epidemiology, they should have a uh, some of them should be trained in, in vector surveillance and vector control activities. They're already seen at the table. It's a lot easier to convince them to uh, be more responsive and aware of the vector issues than, than trying to get someone like myself, uh, who's a, 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 an entomologist by training, to be elevated to get a place at that table. So I think we, in the short term, I think we may need to think about uh, convincing individuals already at the table or those who are in the process of being promoted to that table to take responsibility and take an interest in vector surveillance and control. So that's my short, that, that's my short answer. Yeah, uh, and thank you for that, uh, Tom. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you for that. So the questions are coming through thick and fast and uh, we, uh, to our audience members, uh, we will pick some of them, but we've already run out of time. Basically, we're not going to get all of to all of them. What we do promise to do is to collate all your questions, and uh, we'll we'll collate them into one document. And with the goodwill of our panelists, uh, we'll forward the questions to our panelists and ask if they can respond. Uh, to some of those uh, questions, which we will then re return to all audience members. So we'll try our level best that each of the questions raised will be uh, dealt with uh, as far as possible. So uh, Tanya, I'd like to ask you a question as well. Uh, in your publication, you make the statement that 92% of national malaria control programs felt that they did not have a sufficient capacity to undertake effective vector surveillance. And you go on to make the statement that the main factor that contributed to such inability to implement vector surveillance was inadequate uh, governance. And, and this was reported by the survey respondents themselves. So clearly governance and more specifically strategic planning is a serious shortfall. I want to ask you if you can un unpack a bit more what is meant by strategic planning so people can understand what it is that forms part of this critically important element that is such a great shortfall and impacts on the ability of NMCPs to be able to do effective uh, uh, su uh, surveillance. So just some comments from you, please, uh, Tanya. Is that better? Oh, there we go. That's great. All right, That's great. great. Thanks, Leo. Um, so yeah, the strategic plan is the documentation that outlines the full range of activities that um, are to be implemented by the country for vector surveillance and control. And it, um, this is a country-led process and usually has um, work plans and budgets associated um, with it once the strategic plans are approved at um, a country through the country level and they're often written on three year cycles for malaria or there might be more. Um, but so what we really saw through and this was a really it was a very repetitive theme through all the survey responses just was that vector surveillance wasn't a priority activity. Um, it was often excluded from the strategic plan. So the strategic plans focused only on um, rolling out the vector control activities, bed nets or IRS or whatever um, 
that's within terms of the vectors. Um, and of course, the Zhujili planes contain um, uh, drugs and, and other pharmaceutical components as well. Um, we're just talking about the vector components here. Um, or, or if vector surveillance was included, it, it was limited and maybe only one or two sites for an entire country or a provision to sample only once and twice a year. And often that was related to global fund with the requirement for global fund to um, have insecticide resistance data come through. So that was a very, very limited part and maybe vector um, insecticide resistance data was only done in one or two or so sites. And it just isn't sufficient to answer a lot of the questions. Um, and so what was really clear is that this prioritization for vector surveillance is perceived to the value of the activity. And that's what Tom and Pradeep have been talking about. This is need to really advocate to the highest um, possible levels, the importance of vector surveillance and how it, it's a continual feedback loop, how the vector control is implemented, but we need to implement the surveillance to understand how it's working and improve things as we move forward. And without that component in the strategic plans, that feedback loop doesn't exist and it, it becomes broken. And it all is just coming back to advocacy. And I think this is one of the big things that we need to really start talking about at the, as a community is why vector surveillance is important, what the information means and how it can be used and really start clarifying that so that people can feel comfortable about including it in the strategic plans and even asking Global Fund for funds to support vector surveillance as a part of a comprehensive package. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, there are many uh, answers you could have provided. You gave a good selection, uh, Tanya. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Thank you for that. I know personally uh, frustration uh, traveling and working in some countries where you see field entomologists doing larval surveys, adult surveys, and so on, NMCP entomologists, and they're doing their work, but they don't have adequate or effective entry points into committees and decision-making processes so that the work that they are doing gets taken up uh, mm -hmm. and considered uh, in, in program management, adaptation and fine tuning and so on. So, you know, it's just a lot of things that need to be looked at, but thank you, Tanya. So Robert, clearly there is a need for a new generation of mosquito surveillance tools that incorporate desired target product profiles. Do you have any ideas how one could kickstart the process of getting more support and moving and movement uh, on this. What are your thoughts around, you know, uh, just getting more surveillance tools uh, out there? In, in, any ideas? Well, I, I think I think we all recognize that there is a need. The first step is: can we do? Can come, someone come up with a new idea or a technique? Prove that technique through the proof of concept that it will deliver what we want and then work with Gates or other funders or um, countries to develop that further and make sure that it does deliver the type of information that can be used to make critical decisions. Thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you for that. So let's just take a dip. We're running, we've, we're at, we've actually run out of time, but in fairness, let's take a, a quick dip into some questions from the audience. There's a question here, that, uh, and I'm going to try and get the wording straight. It, there's a need to develop improved surveillance techniques, techniques uh, and the priorities have been identified. So the question is, are researchers focused on the correct priorities? So, so I suppose the question is, you know, is there adequate research taking place 
uh, and that is also tied up with um, adequate research funding availability and, and access to, to funds to do the appropriate and relevant uh, 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 research. Tom, uh, Tom, can I direct that at you? Any thoughts about, you know, research capacity, uh, adequate research taking place and research funding availability? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, Tom. <laughs> I can pass it on to someone else. You're I, mute. I, I, yeah. I think, uh, uh, we're in many ways we're entering a, a bit of a golden age for vector interventions. I mean, we have we have the the processes in place and, and things like VCAG, which are really pushing for you know field evaluations of interventions. There's a lot of different uh, techniques being developed, and I think one of the the byproducts of the interventions being evaluated is the realization that our surveillance techniques are far from optimal. So I think there's a, there's a corollary to that is that it's, it's identifying some key surveillance indicators that we don't do really well. And, and I think a really critical one is, in, in, is uh, uh, and of course, Bob identified a lot of these things already, is, is how do you measure mosquito survivorship? Because in, in the end, we're trying to either prevent uh, man-mosquito contact or we're trying to prevent uh, uh, decrease the mosquito lifespan, and I, we really don't have a good way of doing that. Parity rates are really insensitive. Ovarian dilatations are are scary because of the technical the technical skills required to do this. Uh, there's been some promising techniques like near infrared, which received a lot of attention, but have never really been evaluated in the field. And the people who developed this say that the the problem is you have to have a calibration curve, which may need to be done uniquely for each location and time point that you want to use it. So there's a lot of things that I think where the first part of the process is in place. We're identifying a lot of the problems. We know where our gaps are, and it's a matter of, uh, of um, getting the ears of the funders. I think what gets the ears of the funders is when they're trying to evaluate the interventions and, and the, the word comes back and says, you know, we're really struggling to measure some of these key parameters to, to, for the process indicators of how interventions are packing mosquito uh, populations. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to raise two questions and then I think, you know, we've, we're going to have to very unfortunately try and capture the remaining questions, put it in a document and circulate it in the hopes that uh, some of you will be willing together with, with uh, Appman to try and uh, give short answers to some of the, the key questions that, are, that have been posed. And to our audience members, genuine thank you for your interest and responding so, so uh, positively uh, and making use of the op opportunity. So one of the questions that pops up deals with uh, larval source management. Uh, and, and the statement is made that uh, not much was said about larval source management during the presentations. It's more about IRS and LLINs, uh, ITNs and so on. And the point was made that uh, or indirectly made that uh, in the early years of vector control, early 1900s, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest achievements in malaria control were actually by way of larval source management, filling in swamps and creating drainage ditches, uh, et cetera, using Paris green and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, the, the world moved away from uh, larval control more towards adult control. But I suppose the question is, uh, uh, isn't it time now to spend more time really looking at larval source management as a very useful additional tool for vector population control? Um, and I know everybody talks about it. Uh, yes, we should be doing uh, LSM, but nobody's really doing it, at least from my humble opinion. Do you have any comments on this? Uh, anyone, anyone who would, would like to, to say something on that issue? Larval source management. May I? Please, uh, Pradeep, please. 
uh, we have see why we shifted from larval source management historically because of uh, invention of ddt everybody wants to get rid of the things quickly so adulty side when it was introduced we got it is the same story like when the antibiotics comes in the market you want to take immediately and then get rid of symptoms so adulty side started giving the quick impact and we turned uh, and shifted to that now slowly the larval source management is being picked up not only for malaria elimination but because urbanization of the village stephensai moving to different areas where the urbanization those typical villages have turned into urbanization there the larval uh, anti larval work is being done in addition dengue chikungunya and zika that breeding of aedes has also flared up so the larval source management is done and there are two or three things like uh, biological control with the use of fishes the, the 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 use of bio larvicide then the use of chemical compounds so the quantum of larvicide which was being used is being upscaled slowly and slowly but the basic issue is that to get quick relief only basically adult sites are on priority and that is why these two things uh, llin and irs they are the main stay of the malaria elimination stay thank you yeah no thank you uh, pradeep uh, no point taken completely utterly and i think we're all aware of the advantages of irs and llins so i think the issue is uh, uh, lsm as a supplementary approach not universal but there are species and situations where larval source management uh, could Uh, under certain conditions uh add very significantly uh, especially you know during dry season periods when the 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 population is at a bottleneck and if you could hit the population then uh then uh, you know you could make a significant dent in the start population when the wet season sets in again so So these are all issues that need to be looked at. Um I uh, the our final I'm going to ask Dr. Porn. Oh uh okay Tanya you want to make you want to say something? Uh yeah I just I'll add something really quickly just for the country partners that are listening. Um I s- sat on the global development guidelines group for the WHO this year um that assessed um the WHO recommendations for larval source management um and i just really want to um that it hasn't all been released yet but one thing that i really want to talk about is that there is a despite the fact that we all know that larval source management works in terms of documented strong evidence in the literature it's really really minimal and so i just really want to plead that if people are doing larval source management in their countries if they have capacity or if they have the funders or just generally if people can collect data analyze it and try and get it out there because without that body of literature it it um lessens the support for for funders to to provide funding for a tool that we all know works really really well And so I just really wanted to point that out because it's something that that drives me a little I really want to see a lot more literature so that we can move this forward. Yeah, Do this you is want wonderful. To add Tom? Uh, yeah, so thank you for that Tanya. We're on to an interesting topic here clearly. Tom, uh, please feel free. <laughs> yeah, well I I I'm not really going to uh, contradict Tanya but just to point out that I mean We do know that a lot of the early studies they were really were eco- ecologists basically and 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 understanding the mosquitoes and and the, the the it's very clear that these programs could control malaria very successfully now because they were programs it, it's really hard to dissect out the impact of the larval control from the other things so when we look at a lot of the the, syst- the uh, systematic reviews and stuff that, that sort of summarize the data a lot of these programs showed that they were very effective in controlling malaria over a 10 year period a 20 year period and then there was multiple interventions people learned by doing and and other 
mixes of interventions came in. So again, how do we pull out the, the impact of the larval control? I, I'm, I'm not, not disagreeing that larval control isn't capable with the, the right vector of having significant impacts. But again, it, as Tanya was pointing out, the evidence is, is not, quite frankly, the evidence isn't that great for IRS and LLINs for that matter, if you want to get right, right down to it. But, but the evidence is usually ends up being that we don't have a randomized control trial. And we all know how expensive that is. We're trying to do community-based things and it, they're very expensive. And particularly when programs are convinced that a strategy works. The, the response I've gotten in, in, when I've asked this question to National Malaria Control Chiefs is, well, why should we undertake this big, fancy, expensive study when we know it works? So you've got this catch-22 and you say, well, if you, if you show that, if you can show that it works, then you can get external funding to support doing more of this. And, and, and this, yes, but we don't want to spend our money now investing in something that we already know works. Well, anyway, it, it really comes down to this thing of having the evidence base to, to get the attention, to get the approval of, of uh, the, you know, the VCAGs and, and, and the, those people who sit on MPAG and all the rest in, in the global guidelines and all the rest of the stuff. So it, it's one of those things that really building up the evidence base and, 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 and the, the lack of a recommendation doesn't necessarily mean that it's not felt that it doesn't work. It's just saying that we don't have the evidence to make that recommendation. So that's, that's, it's, a, it's a real challenge mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's an expensive challenge that we, we have to face. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. So, uh, uh, Dr. Pohn, I want to ask if uh, if you could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I think now might be an appropriate time, while we're still going to pose another question or two, maybe it's time to uh, pull up that poll onto the screen uh, so that people in the audience can respond to the poll questions while they listen with one ear to the, the question and, on, and answer. So, uh, there's a, it's a voice of frustration uh, from Derek Shalwood here, where, and, and I have great sympathy, having been on both sides. Uh, who, he, Derek believes that the, the collaboration between research scientists and national malaria control programs needs to be improved, uh, that there's a uh, the two are, tend to move past each other and, and wonderful, productive, mutually beneficial opportunities are being missed um, because the two fundamentally depend on each other. Uh, you know, the NMCPs for innovative new approaches and products and so on, and uh, on the researcher's side for relevant and appropriate uh, uh, research avenues that are practically useful and attractive and appealing to donors. Donors prefer to support research that are relevant in the public health domain uh, and are going to be applied at the end uh, of the day. So, so I, I agree with uh, Derek that, you know, there is lots of scope for improved uh, contact and collaboration. I see it happening all over the place. It's wonderful to see universities uh, working together with national area control programs, supporting them, even with basic surveillance, but uh, often, uh, very often in other ways as well. And, and uh, insecticide resistance assays and so on is another thing where universities and research institutions are often very useful. But there's still uh, ample space for improved collaboration. Uh, so maybe this must be formalized in, in one way within countries where they create a platform for an annual meeting to discuss these opportunities, uh, et cetera. Uh, Tom, do you have any comments on that? Not really. I got to admit, I was distracted by reading all the, the questions on the, the chat there. <laughs> all right. Well, is <laughs> yeah. I've been cut out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tanya, comments from you on, on that aspect of improved collaboration between 
the research community and our NMCPs. Or oh, Robert, I'm going to come to you next if Tanya can't respond either. <laughs> and then Dr. Pradeep as well. <laughs> I will come back to I'm happy that I'm happy to, to, to know that you jogged my memory about the question. How can you get there, there's definitely a, a it's definitely lacking. And when we, we talked about and a good example of what I'm gonna say is the, the data on how many countries in Asia, how many national programs in the Asia Pacific are doing uh, PCR identification of mosquitoes. We know that this capacity exists in, in the research institutions in, in almost all of these countries, and yet that linkage isn't there. And that seems to be a low hanging fruit to, 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 to bring in, you know, the, the, uh, the universities and the research institutes which have that capacity and, and to link them in with the national programs. Because, I mean, all, almost every country in the Asia Pacific has incredible universities with incredible skill sets and great research programs and, and, and getting that linkage to support the national programs is it would seem to be a win-win. It should be a, a cost-effective way to improve the surveillance programs and the national programs. So I think it's undoubtedly true that there isn't, there's, it's a weak link in, 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 in the process and, and it certainly should be encouraged. Uh, so, Thank you for that, Tom. Um, we're now one and a half hours into the webinar, half an hour theoretically over what we had ideally optimally uh, budgeted for. Uh, I want to thank our panelists uh, and our technical support staff uh, sincerely for your time, your contributions. I found it a highly stimulating uh, webinar uh, lots of very interesting issues, questions, uh, and probing of issues that took place there. I, I found it a wonderful webinar. So to each of you and the members of our audience that came up with wonderful uh, observations, comments, and questions, and I promise you we will try and answer your questions. Don't lose faith. Uh, to all of you, uh, a genuine, sincere thank you for your participation and uh, meet you all and interact with you on a different platform at a different time again. Thank you so much. Have a great day.